So hopefully you've caught the first episode of our four part series. This is the second part. Now most of you that are watching, you asked us to geek out and tell you all the technical details of what happens and what causes bore scoring. So of course, back to the camera, we have Charles and introducing Mark to the table, so to speak, who brings to us knowledge of engine building with OEMs and he's got some really cool, um, we call them toys, but they're instruments of the trade <laughs> to really dig in and tell you what bore scoring is. Be sure to log into your YouTube account, subscribe to our channel, and turn on notifications so you don't miss a video. You look at this block, it looks almost like any other block of an engine. We talked in the first series about how early engines, the material was consistent throughout the entire block. As different processes or different goals manufacturers had, they changed certain parts of the block that needed a certain type of coating or certain types of metals for specifically within uh, these channels here. Tell me a little bit how some of those changes may have affected or maybe the reason of the cause of bore scoring. So looking back at, again, we discussed in the first video, the 944, 968, 928, and then even the air-cooled 27 and three liter engines, they all had alucil cylinders or blocks. And again, alucil, it's high silicon aluminum and it's one material through and through. Where with this block, the M96 engine, it's a Locusil block where it has what I call the localized alucil. So it's again, it's only localized around the cylinder bores. So uh, one of the things that it's a hypothesis, though no, I can't prove this, but looking at the manufacturing process that Porsche used, or rather Coleman Schmidt, who cast the cylinders and the blocks for Porsche back with uh, the older engines, Alucil engines, they used a chemical process that actually would remove the aluminum from the bores and leave the silicon particles exposed. And it's those silicon particles with area around them where the oil film can form around the silicon particles. And when that piston and the rings are traveling up and down, it's riding on that oil film. Riding on that layer of film. Yeah. yeah. So there's a micro geometry and a macro geometry going on here. You know, you mentioned the, the geometry of the block itself isn't symmetric. I mean, look where the bores are. Right. So there's something big going on geometrically. And then there's something microscopic going on geometrically to get lubrication in the right places in that environment. So think about uh, putting a paint can in the oven. You crank up the oven, the paint can's a cylinder, and it pretty much stays a cylinder. Mm -hmm. But if you welded a whole bunch of stuff on the side of the paint can and then cranked up the temperature with an explosion, yeah. like what goes on in an engine, one side of that paint can's gonna expand while the other side's got a bunch of mass holding it in place. Well, here's, here's mm -hmm. your paint can. Exactly. We've got all sorts of <laughs> variable mass around right. it. Right, and you're gonna put an explosion inside there. Right. So, so is that part of the reason why, you know, bringing your vehicle up to temperature at a reasonable rate and not hammering it right away is because you want everything to warm up exactly. consistently? Keeping that shape growing together rather yeah. than one side grows faster than the other side. You had a great point on environment, right, Charles? Yeah, because we see, it seems like there's more instances of bore scoring in cars from colder climates or that cars that are driven in cold weather, especially uh, we see it more of more Cayennes with issues from Canada, just, mm. just to give you an, an example, because this bore scoring issue isn't just for Locusil blocks. It can happen to Alucil blocks as well. Not a, nowhere as frequent as we see with the Locusil, but it can happen to an Alucil block. Going back to the, um, the silicon particles. And again, why it's so important to have that molly in the oil because it's the only thing that can attach to the bores is surface finish. Mm -hmm. And going back to the preparation. And again, I, that a lot of people think that Alucil and Locusil is a coating. It's not a coating, it's a material. And it's, a pro and it's a process that prepares. It's not like nickel where you have a nickel silicon uh, carbide coating that's electroplated on the bore and is honed. These cylinders don't have any, they're not honed. Mm. If you look at a, a alucil or a locusil bore, there's no honing marks it's the whatsoever. Material itself. Yeah, yeah. Th that it's not the honing marks that you would see in nickel or in an iron bore. It's not those honing marks in the valleys uh, holding the oil it's those silicon particles that are holding the oil. And without those silicon particles, the whole system just falls apart. Yeah, th there's a myth that 
we need to make our surfaces better and better, meaning shinier and shinier. This is exactly the opposite. What we're making is, remember the movie Close Encounters, The Devil's Tower, you know, that mm -hmm. tower with a yep. flat top? Yep. We're making an infinite number of Devil's Towers that are smooth on top mm -hmm. to, you know, carry a load, keep things, you know, a smooth sliding surface, but flooding the area around the Devil's Tower with lubricant. Uh, Damon will put the photo up in the video where you can actually see all the different silica peaks, right? Yeah. And that's the, the top of... Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the Devil's the Tower, and they're flat, actually. When you look at a profile graph, we'll put up a profile graph, they're flat on top, and the aluminum is eroded around them. It looks just like the Devil's Tower. And so when bore scoring happens, it actually chops off these towers, and now you're just left with a flat surface, which there's no place for the oil to be held, and that's why the aluminum starts to hit each other. Yep. Yeah, materials like to stick to themselves. So when an aluminum surface comes in contact with another aluminum surface, they, they get happy and weld. So silicon is that inert thing in the way that keeps those materials from welding to each other. So maybe here's a good opportunity to maybe talk about some of the tools that you brought. And we showed you the picture where you have the peaks in the valleys. And I'll, and I'll get out of this you, How do you use all of this and, and, and what are you investigating when you're looking at a cylinder? So right now we have just a, a handheld microscope and it's amazing for relatively small money we can get you know 30 to 300 times magnification which is more than enough to see these features. It's, it's quite exciting to see things that you can't just tell by looking at them but when you put your eyes in there at that scale it's wow. This yeah. is, it, it's really important when you see it at that scale. Next to it is just a simple skidded stylus based roughness gauge. So it's a very fine diamond point that we trace over the surface and we can see the geometry of the surface, the actual height. Wow. The microscope shows us color primarily. It's, it's a color image. The stylus is a height data set. So it's, it's measuring at molecule levels the height of which this, the, the stylus is being dragged over. Yeah, um, not quite molecules <laughs> at this scale, but pr getting very close. Very close. Yeah, very, very close. And, and for a sense of scale, um, I speak metric, and in the metric world, you know, we're talking roundnesses and roughnesses in the micrometer scale. You know, f four microns, five microns of roundness is where we like to be in a lot of engines. That's smaller than a smoke particle. Oh, wow. Your home smoke detector detects five micron particles. So we are in a realm to get the performance we need. This is crazy precision stuff. It's, this is amazing. This is rocket science in your car. Um, <laughs> this is really cool. Mm -hmm. In the world of cylinders, what we're investigating is load carrying and lubrication carrying. And it's this magic equation of can we seal combustion but stay wet for lubrication? So we're walking this fine line all the time, this it magic. It seems so opposite. It is, it's yeah. totally contradictory. We're going to want an oil film for slipperiness, but we don't want to burn oil. So the magic is, as the ring just reaches the top, it just barely runs out of oil and there's only fuel above it. Mm -hmm. So at that transition, you've just finally gotten rid of your last slippery oil, and now it explodes and comes back down. That balancing act is a balance of smooth and rough. We need you know, low friction, smooth, no peaks in the way, but rough to carry that lubrication around the Devil's Tower. So as I'm looking at a surface, I'm looking at it through the eyes of load carrying and sealing, and through the eyes of garbage collection and lubrication retention. So there's a theory that in, say, a honed surface, oil is just going to blow out of the valleys. They don't count. And there's another theory that, no, you have to have valleys because of oil. Well, we know we need them, but is it because, or does it get blown out, or what it is? The other theory is micro debris. As any materials run together, you're going to pick up little snowballing effect pieces of metal. So having area underneath, between the devil's towers, is where the garbage goes. Mm. So my world of looking at a surface here, either through a microscope or through a stylus, is a world of load carrying and sealing balanced with garbage collection and oil retention.
So is it important or right to say with the garbage ending up in those valleys, keeping good fresh oil, proper oil in your engine, you get rid of the trash Absolutely. that you just talked about, and then you reintroduce clean oils and your valleys are now nice and full of it, good oil. Exactly. They're like the, the gutters of London in the old <laughs> days, right? Everybody dumped their yeah. buckets in the gutter yeah. and it flushed out. So there is both things. I mean, the oil is cooling, the oil is collecting garbage, the oil is providing a lubrication, and it's recycling so it's clean the next time around. And that explanation of the garbage collection is actually a great example. If you actually research there's, uh, how these blocks wear, they actually call it the ultra uh, mild wear regime. Mm -hmm. And basically you get little bits of wear debris Absolutely. The, from the rings, you get the iron, and that actually get, will get stuck in the aluminum. And that's normal and it's okay, and that allows the ZDDP actually to bond mm -hmm. to the to the ferrous that's embedded in the aluminum, and that actually helps promote a stronger wear, wear film. And, it, and But eventually there's a, a, a breakdown, but right. initially the surface finish actually improves after break-in with a Locusil or Alusil because of getting that, that debris, that micro debris embedded sure. into the aluminum. Fascinating, mm -hmm. that's cool. Now what about fuel? Because I hear yeah. about fuel quite a bit when people talk about bore scoring. So uh, one of the things that we see that, at, that ethanol fuels that we're seeing engines have injector issues, that they're getting poor fuel spray or the injectors start leaking. And f uh, anyone so that's, that's not atomizing it's not, and, and, and not yep. introducing fuel at a consistent or even flow. Yeah, because fuel has to atomize for it to burn. Right. If it's just pooled, it just washes the oil away. Mm. And what happens if you have a leaky injector that's just dumping raw fuel in the cylinder that's not atomized, or if you have poor fuel spray and it's concentrating at one area of the bore, it can be washing that lubrication away. Mm. And, you, and fuel is not a lubricant. It's a solvent. Right. So that's one of, one of the concerns we have with ethanol fuels, um, that these engines should, according to Porsche, be able to take uh, E10 fuels from the box drawn up. The older engines, not so much. Porsche put a bulletin out a few years back that said that E5, so basically 5% was the limit. And back in, uh, say, 2007, that, that's about where average ethanol content was in our fuels in the U.S. It was about 5%. And, uh, but nowadays... But now it's over 10%. Yeah. So do you think there's a correlation to more of this bore scoring issue happening because the ethanol levels we don't even know what brand, but just in general, more ethanol is present in fuels. I, b I believe so. And that, that t makes you take an extra step to make sure you use top tier fuels that have more detergents to help ensure the injectors are clean. They also check for moisture content. There's much more stringent uh, controls for moisture content because you don't want water right. in, your, in your gas. And ethanol fuels will hold, uh, like an E10, will hold 10% by weight water and we, and in the gas and we talked about this uh with lake speed jr so we'll insert a little uh click thing here so you can watch that video because he goes into full detail about top tier ethanol and and all that yeah so what else is there potential so we talked about temperature we talked about fuel what else could cause bore scoring um another real big one we see that there's lots of plastic components on the engine oil fill tube aos vent tubes all those items they can crack and create a vacuum leak. And the, the car's smart. It has an ECU. It thinks it's lean. Oh, it's gonna add more fuel add to try. More fuel. It sees, and we just said it's a solvent. <laughs> it's a solvent, so it thinks it's running lean and adds more fuel, but it's actually rich. And, it, and that's washing down cylinder bores. So that's another thing that, that you, can, you can look at. Um, the other- how, how, how would a- you know, how would a driver of a car know that's the case? Um, there's, uh, I did a video with Tony Callis on f understanding fuel trims. And if you have a Durametric or access to a P-Wiz or some other diagnostic tool that you can actually look at fuel trims, you can actually see if they're in the range they're supposed to. But stepping back, a, a one basic step would be use a smoke tester. And I did a video with Tony as well showing how you use a smoke tester. And the general idea is you pump at low pressure uh, into the throttle body with throttle body open, of course, uh, smoke. 
and then you just look to see if, if it starts coming out somewhere else. If it starts coming out through an or somewhere where smoke's not supposed to come out, with engine off, of course. Yes. Uh, that then you know you have a vacuum leak. You have something broken that you need to fix. And then another another variable in all this is uh, the oil that you're using. That uh, um, some oils are better than others, and especially with um, alucil engines, locusil engines. That everyone knows what ZDDP is at this point. Mm -hmm. They know it's an anti-wear additive. ZDDP doesn't matter at all with this problem because the ZDDP has, can only bind to an, a ferrous surface, iron. Iron, which is why people always talk about like air-cooled cars, the older cars that had iron, that camshafts, cam rockers, things for the lifters. ZDDP to adhere yep. to. But here we're talking about aluminum. Aluminum. And the only additive really that can bind is moly. And the, the mechanism with Molly is that when you have heat and pressure, that it forms, they call it its glassy plates. And the Molly will form a sheet. And then it'll, the Molly can attach to itself and it'll make sheet after sheet. And then as it starts wearing, it sloughs the sheets off. So the idea, it'll slough a sheet off and build another sheet and just keep on doing that right. repeatedly. So using an oil that has high levels of Molly and going back to the Cayenne uh, crowd, if you go to Renless, for example, everyone swears by running Liquamoly oil mm -hmm. and Liquamoly Ceratec. It says Molly in it. <laughs> oh, well, well, uh, not not every Liquamoly, yeah, not every Liquamoly oil actually has any Molly in it. Right. So you, have, it, you need to search for and make sure that what yes. you're using actually does have Molly, not just the name. Yeah, because an A40 spec oil by default is not supposed to have any Molly in it by the Porsche mm -hmm. spec. So just because the brand set, uh, brand set has Molly in the name doesn't necessarily mean it's in there. And the reason why the Ceratec works is that it's adding boron and also Molly as friction modifiers, and, this, and it does work. There are other oils available. I'm partial to Driven. They're the DI40 and the DT40 for, for uh, this and the later generations because they have very high levels of Molly, much higher than even. Now, how do you tell by looking at the bottle that it has? You have molly. absolutely no clue unless you've actually uh, taken a Great. sample, <laughs> unless you've taken a sample of the oil and you've sent it out to have it analyzed to see what's in it. Uh -huh. Because most manufacturers of, of oils will not publish what, their, what the content is of any additives in their oil. That's trade secret. Oh. So, but you can send a sample out, have it analyzed, and it'll, it'll tell you. Well, there you have it. Just a, you know, part two of uh, our four-part series. We Next, we'll probably be talking about what, as owners, you can do to address poor scoring. Yep. Stay tuned. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,